Média. Le monde, c'est nous. British uh, fighters publicly executed two unarmed men in Guzang, Cameroon's northwest region on October 4, 2023. The execution, which was filmed, corroborates previous accounts of killings by armed separatist groups, some of them also captured on video. According to Human Rights Watch, separatist fighters show wanton lawlessness and cruelty against civilians in Cameroon's anglophone regions. Separatist leaders should immediately rein in their fighters and order them to uh, to stop attacking civilians the video that human rights watch verified and geolocated to guzang shows at least two separatist fighters execute two unarmed men whom the separatists accuse of being spies for the Cameroon army in front of a crowd one of the civilians or victims shake his hand and wave his head in denial of the accusations the video has been shared widely on social media during the roughly one minute video, the fighters also say they have a message to Rene to come and collect the bodies of those killed, but they did not specify who Rene is. Rene is believed to be a local community or the local uh, Cameroon military commander. Equally, we shall be discussing Africa on today's program African Union at the G20. In recent months, several known African actors have expressed their wish to see the African Union AU uh, represented in the group of G20, a forum of international economic cooperation among industrialized countries. This is a laudable recognition of the strategic importance of uh, Africa and the AU in particular. At the AU's February summit, African leaders decided that the body who represents the continent in the G20 alongside South Africa, which is a member in its own right, the momentum of Africa's representation in formal and informal global governance forums has never been higher. Most uh, United Nations, the United, the UN Security Council permanent member uh, members also claim to favor permanent African representation of uh, the on the council we'll be looking at the benefits of africa at the africa uh, at the g20 and why now and what does africa stand to benefit as a continent at the g20 stay with us this is the pan african today Simu. bonsoir Fidel. Hello, thanks for joining us on today's edition of the Pan-African Debate. Welcome to your Pan-African Television This is Africa Media. It's another opportunity again for us to uh, put an eye and discuss some of the issues and uh, events uh, affecting the African continent directly or indirectly. Today on the program, we shall have as a topic of discussion, we're looking at Cameroon and the recent killings by separatist uh, fighters in the northwest and southwest regions. The killings continue and civilians uh, continue to bear the brunt. We'll be looking at uh, the impact of such uh, cruel killings of uh, unarmed civilians. Regarding the crisis that continues and is ongoing in Cameroon's dwindling speaking regions for seven years now and counting, we shall equally on the program discuss uh, the Africa Union at the G20. And what does this mean? What does Africa's uh, presence at the, U, uh, the G20 uh, will mean? And what will it change? And what does Africa stand to benefit? Uh, being a member of the G20. That's, of course, our two topics for discussion on today's program, Pan-African Debate. We invite you to stay with us and endeavor to send us your contribution. We shall be open our lines for you to send in your reactions. You can call us directly on WhatsApp. Uh, the numbers will be on your screen when we be time for you to call. You can equally send us your contributions. Give us a brief message direct to the point on our Facebook Live page. Those of you watching us live on Facebook, we shall read your comments here. And thanks for joining us again. And uh, uh, joining us today to discuss these two topics, we have uh, with us here Mr. Uh, Robert Kedia. He's a member of uh, the CBZ. Mr. Robert Kedia, it's a pleasure having you. Welcome to the Pan African Debate. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Greetings to my co panelists. Greetings to all those that have taken their time to sit in front of their TV screen and listen to us talk. Special greetings to the to all the families that have lost uh, their members during this period of crisis in the Northwest and in the Southwest region, like the Anguafos family, 
which uh, she was killed as uh, and all those that have lost their life uh, killed by uh, the carnivorous terrorist group of uh, Ambazonia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Robert Kidio. Thanks for coming. Uh, we equally have with us here Mr. Ndium Emmanuel. He is a civil society actor. Mr. Ndium, it's a pleasure having you. Welcome to the panel fan debate. Thank you very much. Uh, Good afternoon to all the viewers of Pan African Debate. It's been a while I've not been this on this platform. So today I thought it wise to scrape off time out of my busy schedule to yeah. answer present. Mm -hmm. I wish to extend my sincere condolences to all the bereaved families uh, that have lost their loved ones in the various accidents that have occurred in Cameroon between Monday and today. Uh, if you were to go counting, just the ones that I know, there are above 20. And I've been asking myself, somewhere, somehow, people used to think that it was the root that kills. Uh, others think that it is man that kills. But we are seeing it with our very eyes. What is the root, the, 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 the worthiness of the cars that are using our road? Because most of these accidents have resulted from back failures from these uh, Cavignon drivers, truck drivers, and it's a very sad reality. I want to think that uh, the road transport sector, and the routier, should actually sit up and take the measures that can curb such accidents so that roadworthiness should be re-evaluated in Cameroon. That alone can go a long way to save a lot of lives. We, we cannot keep losing people. We know first of all we don't have roads in the first place. The little uh, uh, dead traps that we have in the name of roads, we still uh, uh, permit cars not worthy enough to fly such routes to keep killing our people. For how long are we going to keep losing our people to accidents? Over speeding too is another factor which uh, the driver should uh, consider. Just like you said, the roads and are not out, the very yes. best. We have on the other side is the Metro Alex uh, Ndif Lesinger. He's a political consultant and human rights advocate. Metro Alex, uh, it's a pleasure having you. Welcome to the Pan African debate. The beautiful people of the Cameroons, I also extend my fraternal greeting to Katia, Jimum, and I don't know if the other panelists are there. And I'm happy to be on this debate to talk about extrajudicial killing, which is unlawful killing, which is killing somebody without following the due process of the law. And also to talk about the influence or the impact of the G20 on Africa. It's a pleasure always to be on your program. Thank you very much, Med, for honoring our invitation. It's a pleasure having you. We also have uh, John Barakuru. He's the president of Consortium. Uh, it's a pleasure having you, John Barakuru, if you're there. Welcome to the program. All right, uh, while we're waiting for John Barakuru to connect, let's have uh, Viviana Yafo, political and human rights advocate. Welcome to the Pan African debate. Okay. We Thank you so much. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, sure. We can hear you. We can hear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to appreciate everyone who's joining our participants and contributors as well i i equally want to uh, ex express my gratitude to uh, the hosts of the uh, of this program um i i love the conversation um every start of uh, to an end of a conflict starts with conversations like this and um, I, I really hope that this starts some kind of healing, some kind of justice, some kind of peace to our people. Um, again, I want to appreciate everyone who's joining. Also, as a mother, I, I want to heartily, heartily send my condolences to all the families that have suffered and continues to suffer 
uh, through these very difficult times and through this senselessness, it's absolutely unnecessary. We must talk mm. as a people. Yeah. We must sit down. We must have this conversation. Thank you, Louis, for having this. And uh, it is my pleasure to be a participant. I have a little cold, so I'm not going to be joining on video. My apologies. Thank you. Thanks for joining, and uh, we'll be glad to get more contributions for you in the course of the pro from you in the course of the program. Thank you for being there. Uh, let's try to reestablish connections with Mr. John Bakuru, uh, President of Consortium. John Bakuru, uh, are you there? Okay, um, right away, while we're hoping that John Bakuru joins, we want to welcome those of you just tuning in. You're on Afric Media, the Banafran channel, and we're discussing Cameroon as one of our topics today, the extrajudicial killings by separatists in the Northwest and Southwest regions. Before we uh, begin that uh, topic, let's uh, check on this video. We'll play the video for just a few seconds before we come back to begin our discussions for today. Stay with us while we get to our technicians to give us that video go now no, the one they were there for bar. Behind yourself. We move the one one. Give me message so. Now send a Dorine. You can carry them. Go bear up. No, yeah. I go tell them. me can take them. Tell them. Let's me can carry them. Go bear up. You can take them. Thanks very much uh, to our technicians, and uh, that's of course what we're looking at today on the program: extrajudicial killings of civilians in the northwest and southwest regions. That's uh, where we are with regards to a seven-year crisis that continues to uh, bring a lot of, take a lot of lives and destroying properties. Uh, Mr. Robert Kedia, we just watched that video, and we're looking at the crisis that has been ongoing in Cameroon, swing-speaking regions for seven years. That's, uh, of course, the situation on the ground. It is very sad when uh, uh, people rise up, of course, uh, to express their view that they are being marginalized, which is true, and nobody has said uh, there is no uh, marginalization, of course. And uh, people of that Northwest and Southwest region expressed themselves. They came out with peace plans and uh, engaged in uh, civil disobedience as a way to let the state be aware that uh, they are not happy with the situation. But uh, unfortunately, some uh, hoodlum uh, took over uh, the cry of the people and decided to carry out act of barbarism, which is no longer uh, the aspect of uh, marginalization anymore. We now have uh, Anglophones that say that they have been marginalized instead of killing their own uh, brothers. What you see on TV there, they are fellow people from the same v uh, division, the same subdivision, the same village killing their own blood brothers. We now see people refusing their own biological children from going to school. We now see people beheading their own blood brothers from the same village, burying them alive, collecting ransom, raping them, arresting cops, dead people that they are going to go and bury, they arrest their cops. And they see uh, they are out to complain about the marginalization of the Northwest and Southwest region. They are out to revendicate that they have been marginalized, but they are the one killing their own. That is uh, unheard of. That is something that is beyond human comprehension, that you kill your own fellow brothers and sister, 
that the world will see what Yaoundé is doing to your people, that you are not in concurrence with Yaoundé. Your own children have left the region. They are now in the French region. They are becoming Francophones. So those, that's the situation where uh, we have arrived today. And uh, I still call on my brothers of the Southwest and uh, Northwest region that uh, revendications are being done diplomatically okay. to express their worries. It, they don't have to do that in a state of barbarism or terrorism for their voice to be heard. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Robert Kedia. Uh, Mr. Deum, we watched that video. Those two people were accused of uh, being spies to the military. And this is the situation where we've arrived at today. Uh, the uh, military will definitely uh, arrest anyone who is suspected to be a spy uh, on the side of the separatists, just like the uh, separatists as well will extra or kill those they believe to be spies on the side of the military. The population are caught up in the middle. Who do we blame at this point? This is a crisis as uh, the outcome uh, of a crisis that has not been resolved completely for the past seven years, although uh, solutions have been put in place, but then we still have this ongoing. OK. Um, Luis, you, before I start, and to ask, uh, when I saw this video, I asked myself a question. I took our time to listen and watch the video. In listening and watching the video, it took me lots of minutes. And the first question that came to my mind was, they came, it was a market day. They announced that the market be shut down and that everybody should follow them to the square. They went to the square. They called for what? Quotes and in on quotes. The corporates, as they put it, the informants, mm -hmm. the black legs. Mm -hmm. I heard there's a black leg community I never knew existed in Cameroon. Uh, they came out. They passed judgment on them by declaring what their crime was. And I was asking myself, the time that it took, with the kind of security and the military presence in Northwest and Southwest, as I know, was there nobody to call or to alert the military? Or is it not a kind of a situation now, uh, where- you talked about alerting the military, this goes back to be uh, the same reason why they are being killed, because they are accused of being spies or informants. Since they started the killing spies, spies have not finished. Since they started killing Amber, Amber has not finished. In either side, mm. they are increasing, or they are redoubling the effort. So my question that I was about to learn is, with all the military artillery that we have in Norway and Southwest, all this happened right to the execution form, without the intervention of the military. A military that is being deployed for such a task, and that paid for that, points to one thing. The role of the gun has failed. The gun will not solve the war. Mm. And to think that it all happened in front of everybody, people had phones, doesn't mean that nobody had the courage even to secretly lie to the uniformed men in that subdivision. It happened, and the military did not even intervene after three hours. And we just got the phone writing from his hideout in Yaoundé, denouncing. It equally points to the fact that the role of the gun has failed. Like Madame Ayafo said a while ago, Luis, we need to talk. Mm. We must talk. If we have failed to listen to each other for seven years, I think it is time that we must talk. To now answer your question squarely, you are asking if we are asking who should be blamed. Okay. Well, uh, there is no reason, I first of all condemn the act of taking away anyone's life, be it by the government forces or be it by the Ambazonian forces. Mm. I have said for four years running that guns can kill terrorists, but no gun has ever killed terrorism. Mm. What we need to do, Turkey has killed terrorism in most parts of the world. And the sad thing is that wars 
always end where they ought to have started, mm. which is the round table. Round table gives solutions, but round bullets comes out to kill. There is no peaceful bullet. If the president of the republic, whom I don't know where he has been hiding for so long, cannot come out to put a stop to this thing that he started, I want to think that he does not care the legacy he wants to leave in Cameroon, in the annals of Cameroon history before leaving. So okay. the institutions, it also equally means that for seven years, we have parliamentarians and senators from Northwest and Southwest. They have been to the Senate to and from. They have never rest or walk out of the Senate or the National Assembly because the Senate president or the National Assembly president has refused to table this thing for discussion in the parliament or at the Senate. It equally means that they are accomplices. Mm -hmm. The elites of Northwest and Southwest, they are accomplices. Those people who hide in Yaoundé writing condolence messages in the name of elites, they are accomplices. Some of us who talk here, we still bear the risk to go back to Norway and Southway to even fight. I am sure you heard, the, you saw the message that circulated that Ndiyum was shot in Boyo because he went to campaign for school boycott, for, for, I mean for, for school resumption. And the Amba people thought that I had become a blackleg. But I've always assumed that position from the one that no child should stay out of school. When they saw me walking free without a bullet on me, their propaganda died down naturally because I took the courage to go back, tell the people of my community, children must go to school, mm. and I keep repeating it. Okay. While you people are fighting, we have seen in Yemen, we have seen everywhere in the world, children were going to school. Okay. But to think that you hold our children hostage because of something that the children did not bargain for is barbaric. And to also believe that we can say that Amber is operating as it wants points a finger to the barrenness of Cameroonian institutions. If the institutions were not barren, if they were working, all these things would not have been operating. Instead of sending people every day on failed missions, let me tell you, construct the routes, give them the light, give them water, give them those social amenities that they wanted. Automatically, the government will win over the hearts of the people of Norway and Southwest. Mm. As I talk to you now, before you take the microphone, the marginalization spree continues. You recently saw the release of the 400,000 police with two anglophone names. That's the marginalization. You recently saw how Mbaragangele was in Douala to install the second production center for ID cards, which means those people west of the Mungu must travel across to east of the Mungu, that remains the marginalization. So the government needs to look for strategies to equalize, to balance the equation of the two people who came together on a, an equal pedestal. Otherwise, the frustration continues. But we are not backing the barbaric acts of those who call themselves Ambazonia. Because if you came to protect the people and you are killing them, then there is no other name that can be given to you mm. than the name that people have been calling. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ndium. Uh, killing the same people you claim to uh, be protecting, that's uh, what we just saw from a video, a uh, one-minute video, the following the extrajudicial killing of two uh, unarmed civilians in the Northwest uh, region. Uh, let's talk with you, Metro Alex Ndiv. Um, this is as a result of a seven-year crisis that is still unresolved. And where do you think we're heading from, from now? And who do you think, let's begin with, who do we blame? Uh, at this point with regards to the outcome which we are having now the population civilians have been accused of being spies the military and they are killed same way those who are believed to be working with the separatists are equally taken away by the military me i would really like to use the word blame i would like to focus more on your question extra judiciary killing by separatists. That's what the question says. The impact, that's what, what I want to say. I don't really want to go out of topic. Yeah, extrajudicial killing really is what we call extrajudicial 
execution, extra legal killing. That's killing somebody deliberately without lawful authority or judicial proceeding. That's what extra judicial killing means. And your question said by the separatists. I would like also to clarify this to our public. A separatist is a person who supports separation from a particular group, from a large body, especially because of ethnicity. Separatism doesn't mean violence. So I want to make this because in Cameroon, we have tried to say separatists are with, with violence. There are people who are separatists in Cameroon, in the CPDM party, they are not violent. I am not violent, other people are. So I should make that correction, it's very important. The people who kill somebody, is it in Guzan? To me, they are criminals. That's how I call them. I don't call names, they are criminals. And in Cameroon, when there is a crime, who is responsible for that and other government? One, I should tell you, the job of a government is to govern, is to govern. And if you look at the Constitution of Cameroon, you look at Article 5, Sub 2, it said the president shall ensure the respect of the Constitution. Article 8, Sub um, 3 says the president is head of the armed force. Article 2 says um, the president shall guarantee the internal and external security of the country. So what I saw in Guzan, Guzan is not really a bush. It is a square. I remember Sakwe was beheaded in Guzan and the people, they were clapping. That's not the first time. We, today, the government, we're supposed to be governing a country. We don't know the killer of Sakwe. That is a square. And what do we need in that square? I'm sure Mr. Ndiwu said something there. We expected the police to be in that square. Who is responsible to put police in that square? It's the government. What is the government? A group of people with authority to govern a country. My point is, is the government governing the Cameroon? What do I expect from any government, not just in Cameroon, any government, including the United Kingdom? You need what? Leadership to maintain law and order, to enforce laws, to provide national security, to provide economic security and economic assistance. My point is, if we go back to the constitution of Cameroon, is the ruling CPGM government upholding the constitution? The answer is no. Yes, we can sit here. We condemn criminals all over the world. I am very saddened to see young, healthy people, bullets put on their head. But that is not our question. The question is extrajudiciary killing. What impact? And the impact is it has exposed that there is a vacuum in the government of Cameroon. It has exposed that the characteristics, I'm not the one making, when you have what they call like a failed state, the characteristic, the international definition of a failed state, it means the government cannot control part of its territory. Can the government of Cameroon control part of its territory? No. I don't want to sit here and start talking. I know what's a war crime. What happened in Guzan is a war crime. When they commit criminality in your country, who is supposed to make sure that there's law and order? The ruling CPDM party. In any country on earth, when people start blaming criminals, it means the government is, has failed. If you start blaming criminals. In the United Kingdom, when there is knife crime, crime in the street, they blame Sadiq Khan, the mayor. There's a job description. It is his job to make sure there's law and order in London. And the prime minister, the difficulty in Cameroon is that we have parliamentarians, senators, governors, head of regional assembly. The problem is they don't have a job description. When there's a problem in Cameroon, they wait for the head of state to give order. The head of state has to give order about policing. When we have police, be gendarme, all those forces. The head of state have to, when Martinez Zogo was killed, the police, they were quiet. The head of state have to give decision, investigate it. That is the problem. The parliamentarian in Cameroon, they don't know their job description. The governor doesn't know their job description. I'll give you an example. In Cameroon, um, witchcraft is a criminal offense. I have seen civil administrator deals saying that they should use witchcraft in order to fight Ambazonia. So a person who is supposed to uphold the law is saying you should break the law to fight Ambazonia. 
recently, the governor of Southwest province or region said we should terrorize the terrorists. What is terrorism? Terrorism is a criminal offense when you have a governor saying that they should terrorize the terrorists. It means commit crime by fighting terrorists. How do you expect people who are supposed to govern the country saying such a thing, then the president is quiet? As if this is not enough, you saw senator praising the governor saying that they should commit crime. It means terrorizing the terrorists means commit crime to solve crime. That's what it means because terrorism is a criminal offense. So that's the governor saying it. Then the mayor of Goya too is applauding it, terrorize the terrorists. So how do you have people who are aging and abetting criminality? How come that they are running our country? I'm so sad because if you look at the constitution of Cameroon, the laws of Cameroon, most of the people who are in that position, they are not fit for purpose. They don't have a clue on how to govern a country. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Metro Alex, and if uh, we got you clearly. Uh, we're talking with you, uh, Madam uh, Ayafo Vivian. Uh, just listen there to the first three panelists who highlighted their points and uh, Metro Alex and if, uh, highlighted the fact that those who are responsible for the killings uh, there are, of course, he said criminals are responsible for the killings, and those who are separatists, of course, are, you know, are not uh, in that direction. Now, who do you think we should blame here with regards to that killing? Uh, Metro said they are criminals, and uh, of course, we we're looking at a crisis that has not been resolved properly, which has resulted to uh, such extrajudicial killing of uh, the population by separatist fighters. Who do you think we should blame here? Thank you again. That question is for me, right? Sure, yeah. Just wanna make sure. Uh, thanks again, uh, gentlemen. Um, we, <laughs> this didn't start today. Right. Um, we are redressing, we are trying to redress issues that started decades ago in one instance. We are trying to put blames on a situation that has been going on for decades. We are trying to redress a failure, total failure in administration, total failure in governance, total failure in every single aspect of leadership in this platform. It cannot happen. I, I cannot sit here and tell you that um, the, the, the separatist or who's to blame. I, I completely agree with Metro Alex on his, you know, um, submissions and 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 his x-ray of the situation and and our first speaker i'm sorry i didn't get your name uh properly but th this is the problem we're facing in cameroon right um we're facing a problem of 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 terrible terrible failure in leadership terrible failure Terrible failure in every, if you want to, 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 oh my God, I, I don't even know where to start, Lewis. I don't know where to start. Blaming these guys. And again, like I said from the beginning, my heart drops for, for, for these civilians going through this my heart drops we are talking about these are guys who if if you go and dig deeper in the backgrounds of these guys who these criminals i call them criminals as well if you go and check into their backgrounds these are guys who might might have had um uh barely any kind of education right 
and education is the problem too. They, they might have had barely, barely any kind of education. And then you equate it to a government, to, to people who are supposed to know better. We are not supposed to find ourselves here. Let's take ourselves back to five or six years ago into this crisis. We found people's heads being chopped, right? Let's go back to Sam Soya, right? He was one of the first victims who was butchered in, in broad daylight on, on TV on social media and and you ask yourself who is supposed to know better here our military our um um our our people who are supposed to be trained to know better or these so-called we call now separatists we have all sorts of names for them amber boys whoever it is at the end of the day, Lewis and 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 my brothers and brothers in in the platform, and and the audience, I blame the government of Cameroon. I blame the government. Um, there has been a failure in governance. There has been a failure. The fact that we find ourselves here, right, talking about marginalization, talking about the, the maltreatment. I attended a uh, university at SUA and, and that's where I, my activism started. That's where my advocacy started. That's where I, I, I started noticing this, this gross, this gross um, maltreatment of, of, of uh, Anglophones if you want to call it Anglophones, the maltreatment of Southern Cameroonians, the maltreatment of, of people from the Northwest and Southwest. And when this crisis started, let me tell you guys a short story. I live here in Atlanta, Georgia. I, I struggled to no avail to bring this situation to, to, to the table with the Cameroonian Association here in Georgia for us to sit down as brothers and sisters, both Francophones and Anglophones and talk about it. it, it, it I, I struggled to no avail because the president himself at the time, Ben Ekwala, who comes from, who hails from, 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 from Douala. And I, I, I approached him and I said, we need to be able to sit as brothers and sisters. We cannot just con continue business as usual. Um, and this guy told me, Vivian, I do not believe that this problem is a Cameroonian problem. I do not believe that this, those who are killing or doing whatever is happening in the Northwest province are Cameroonians. They are infiltrating from infiltrators from Nigeria. And oh my God, I, I, I opened my eyes and I'm like, Ben, I am, I, I am shocked that you're educated and you're making such comments. You're going back to the fact that you're, you're claiming that um, me, Vivian, I know nothing. I say, are you aware of the fact that you're speaking to an Anglophone who happens to be very learned and educated? Are you telling me that I am Biafran? Are you telling me that we know nothing and somebody else has to come and tell Anglophones how to feel, what to stand for, and what to fight for. So I, I say all this to still tell um, my brothers here as hosts, co-hosts, uh, presenters, and the audience that this problem is deep. It is deep. It is complicated. And only until, only until we sit down as brothers and sisters, only until we acknowledge that there is a root cause to this problem. The international community can only do that much. And I have walked in the halls of so many, so many diplomatic doors 
And I've realized that the solution to this problem lies between us as a people first. We need to be able to acknowledge that there is a problem and then we start solving the problem. But at the end of the day, when, um, when you see, when you look at every conflict, who starts it? Two strong men or two people with guns, right? And then who suffers? Those two guys whom we saw sitting on the floor and getting slaughtered in broad daylight. Those are the vulnerable ones who end up picking up the pieces and the consequences of a conflict like the so much complicated one we find ourselves in Cameroon. All right. But we must talk, okay. Lutz and everyone. We must sit around the table and dialogue. Thank okay. you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Viviana Yafo. Uh, you're coming in. We need to sit down, of course, and talk. Uh, let me get from you, Mr. John Bakuro. We just saw a video of two uh, unarmed, you know, say unarmed civilians being shot by separatists. The same people who claim. Uh, to be protecting the population, of course, execute them on live uh, video. Uh, at this point, Mr. John Barker, what do you think is the impact of this, you know, uh, action on the population and to the crisis? Are we moving towards a solution or is it aggravating a really um, delicate situation on the ground? Yes, um, thank you very much, uh uh, Mr. Big Bang, and uh, my regards to all the panelists. I suppose you're able to to hear me well. Uh, I should like begin by pointing a clear finger where it deserves to be pointed. You see, I've listened to uh, my sister Vivian, and I listened to Metro Lizinger. I also listened to Miss Andiwum. I'm delighted to hear some of the things that they said, but I want to make this first correction. Number one, I'm not an Anglophone. Perhaps some some are. I'm a Southern Cameroonian, and I want I always want us to take it from that premise. I'm a Southern Cameroonian. Anglophone Northwest Southwest is a construct of La Republic du Cameroon that led to the creation of the issues that we are facing today. And then again, one of the people clearly responsible. What happened to those boys in Guzan? He seated with you right there in the studio. I can see him, I mean, with his chin resting on his hand. Mr. Kedia Robert knows very clearly that he and people like him are responsible for what happened to those guys in Guzan for the simple reason that you know that by mobilizing innocent civilians and sending them to go playing the dangerous game of being informants to a government that is determined to kill its people, you are putting them in harm's way. Because you see, I was filled with consternation, with anger and frustration when I saw those executions until I saw Mr. Kedia on uh, Equinox television posting that we are the people of the black led community. We cooperate, collaborate with the government, with government forces, to show the high doubts of the amber fighters, then you should understand that when you get into that, you take innocent unarmed civilians to go do the job of the military. You transform them into targets. Let's be clear about it. I like to call a spade a spade. You transform them into legitimate targets. Because when you hear Mr. Kedia boast, the military don't know how to get to the camps. We take them there. They don't know how to get to the bushes to get to all of those places. We take them there. So rather than have a young man like Kedia and the other uh, 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 people who call themselves a CPDM elite and all of those things like the Mbela Mokichals, calling them to organize, I mean, talks, that's to move to the negotiation table so we can have a definitive solution to the problem. They rather link up with that government to kill people who are protesting for their rights, who are fighting for their rights. And therefore, those people will tell you tomorrow that they are acting in self-defense. Because if they don't kill this guy, 
these guys will get them to. That's exactly what it is. I express anger, frustration, and every kind of thing against this act. But when I watched Mr. Kedia, I said, there is absolutely something here. This begins to add up. It is a shame. It's despicable that we should actually take ourselves right to this level. When we talk about separatists, there's no such things as, you know, separatists. Across the world, the, when the people get up and they say we don't want to belong to a certain setup, what happens? They give them the opportunity to express themselves. Major Lisingi will tell you that the people of, uh, 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 is it uh, 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 Scotland, I'm, I'm, I'm actually forgetting, have had the opportunity to hold referendum two times to determine whether they want to be part of the United Kingdom or not. We have seen the people of Quebec in Canada. They have had the occasion at least twice or more or more times to hold referendum peacefully to determine whether they want to be part of Canada or an independent country. Now, when the people of the same people who came freely into some unfortunate union with the Republic, get to let them just return to the federal system that we agreed to, to come together, they get killed. And when the people say, okay, we want to opt out of this union, it becomes war. It was never war from, from the beginning. Should never have been war. And it should never be war. And now, you look at this. Uh, um, I, I really like to uh, give accolades to uh, Sister Vivian for pointing out that the people came on motion and killed the human being alive. We'll come back to you. Uh, sorry for network uh, issues. John Barker will come back to you. Uh, let me just give you a chance to to respond, with, possibly without any question yet. But uh, you listened to John Barker and he directed his statement to you with regards to probably another statement you've made elsewhere. And he said equally that the uh, government should be blamed for you know those who decide to collaborate do they collaborate freely with the military to show the hideouts of these guys but then we understand equally that the population somehow are fed up with the activities of the separatists and somehow they are bound to collaborate with the military to show the hideout of this uh where the separatists are because themselves they feel fed up you see um when you heard uh, madame mayafo the way she spoke and uh, the rest of the co-panelists you see, we are in democracy, and of course, we have a government. And of course, it's just legitimate that uh, we turn to the government that we elected to handle the problem that we have in, in the country. So for sure, I will not uh, oppose them for that. It's their democratic right and opinion, which uh, is welcomed. You see, uh, there is no nation without a problem. Of course, there's no nation without a problem. Cameroon has a problem, which the people of the Northwest, they stood up, all age groups stood up. And this problem could be traced right back in the, um, uh, after the Eastern Regional Crisis when our elected official marched away from the Eastern Regional House and the preparing for independence when some wanted us to join Nigeria. So wanted us to join La Republic du Cameroon and other like the Mbile, uh, the Endele and the rest that want us, uh, the Dembile and the um, uh, Kale that want us to be as an independent nation. And of course, the field. We also move ahead around the 1961 um, when we had the Fumban Conference and things were changed up in 1972. And many people believe that the federal system and the rest was not supposed to be touched or to be changed where the people believe that changing all this is has to do with their violation of uh, the agreement that their fathers had with uh, French Cameroon when they met at Fumban Conference. And we also have a group of people that uh, came up in the 1990s to talk about this very uh, problem, which we had various conferences that were held. So we realized that it's a problem that have been there for a while. And I am one of those that believe that all problems supposed to be handled in a diplomatic way. 
Uh, well, remember when this crisis started, the people stood up, we saw all age group with peace plan to revendicate what the thing that they are not comfortable with and uh, is their right, we are in democracy. But uh, when we allow those pick up, people picking up arms and causing atrocity, that is where the problem comes from. Now, I will still say about this issue of black leg, and let me make this very clear again. Anyone that have lost a family member because of this amber terrorists and carnivals automatically is against them. I will definitely give information to the forces of law in order to track them. Anyone that their house have been burned, those that their family members have been raped, they come to ask you for support. You don't have to take your daughter to the bush to satisfy their sexual urge. Do you think those families will not collaborate with the forces of law and order? Those that have lost family members, those that are internally displaced in the other regions, do you think they will not collaborate with the forces of law and order because they want peace? Imagine you going to bury your father and the corpse is being seized. Will you not collaborate with the forces of law and order to have back your corpse? That is what the people that are fed up are working with the forces of law and order because they want peace. If you like, you call them black legs. If you like, you call them sellout. That's your problem. But anyone that has been touched, a family member, will definitely collaborate with the forces of law and order. No matter the title you want to give them, the mother, no matter how you want to please yourself, that's, uh, please yourself, that's your business. But what we have to do, I see say it. The President of the Republic have called for dialogue. And will continue with dialogue progressively. It is true that with the process of dialogue, it's not just an event. We'll keep on dialoguing and ensure that things come to an end. And uh, we are still calling on our brothers that have picked up arms, that they have the arms. They should drop it and we'll continue with the dialogue. At the moment, it's complicated to say, uh, because now, Mr. Ben Lewis, you realize that when we are talking about disarmament center reconstructions, these are all solutions to the crisis and not uh, that started in 2017. And not even the, the, the problem that the people of Northwest and Southwest they have, or the Anglophone, or the former West Cameroon, or the former Southern Cameroon, no matter the title you want to give to them, but it has to do with people from these two regions. And so we are calling on our brothers to talk with our brothers that are pick up arms, to drop the arms, why we continue with the dialogue. Because the brothers that are pick up arms are not even fighting the military. They now go ahead, like we saw in Babanki, whipping grandmothers of above 80 years, 70 years, lashing them very well. And they say they are fighting for separation. And Mr. John Bakuru, I believe that according to you, those grandmothers of their 70s and 80s that were flocked in Babanki, will you say they are also black legs? And you think that after the maltreatment they have gotten from their children and they see the military, they will not talk about the hideout of these guys? When you arrest somebody's father that is going to bury the father, you get the cops. You don't want that person to collaborate with the forces of law and order? We should be realistic when we are saying things. But I would not want to go to hang on the word of a panelist. We are here to look for the way forward. And for the way forward is for our brothers to drop the arms while we continue in the Republic to revendicate our dissatisfaction that we have. Also, of the Northwest region, yes, we are a people, we are an, an entity. We have the right to revendicate. Those of other regions too are revendicating. Everybody has the right to revendicate because we say in politics is simple. It's war without bloodshed or you say it is the distribution of resources. So everybody wants more. And so for us, instead to fight, to say we have been marginalized, this is what we, we want. But we have instead gotten into a war of after seven years that have destroyed the economy that we see ourselves back as if we are in the 1960s again. Everything has been destroyed. There is no economy again. The separatists that have picked up arms have destroyed us of the Northwest and Southwest region more than the way we can express. They are even more barbaric than the marginalization we are crying. So it's time for us to tell our brothers to drop up their arms while we continue with dialogue. Okay. I am from the Northwest and South, I'm from the English speaking region. And I tell you, when it concerns the dissatisfaction of the people of Northwest and Southwest, 
as an elite, I will definitely stand up to express that uh, my people are not happy. This is what they are uncomfortable with. But when they pick up arms against citizens of the Northwest and Southwest themselves, against their own blood brothers, against their own brothers of the same village, what do you want me to go and do in Yaoundé? What should I tell the government? Your brother is killing your brother. It's not even a battle that we say it's against the forces of law and order that are coming from different regions. No, it is us killing ourselves, which is more even dangerous than anything we can say. As we continue with dialogue, please let those with arms drop it while we continue talking with the government so that we can bring a lasting solution to this. When anyone falls, it hurts, it bleeds. And my co-panelist, Madame Ayafo, actually spoke like a mother that she's bleeding when one Cameroonian fall. And I believe that all of us, we should understand her as a woman. We should dialogue to ensure that the problems we have in our region come to an end so that our, uh, economic development will definitely proceed uh, rapidly so that we should not remain in the state of confusion <coughs> where we are now. Mm. All right. Uh, we got you. Uh, Madame, yeah, for you have something to comment before I come back to Mr. Ndium, briefly. Yes, I, I just I just have a, a quick question for uh, our last speaker. I, I want to ask him, since um, he, he seems more um, inclined to working with the government of Cameroon and, and very close, to the government of Cameroon. I, I want to ask him these uh, few questions or, you know, um, just just get some requests from him. Why hasn't, why has things been so difficult, uh, especially a crisis, a conflict like this, a bloody, bloody conflict like this? Why hasn't it um, been discussed in, within, within the, the, the parliament of Cameroon, why, why has it been so difficult? And, and secondly, why, while he spoke, there are certain things that really came to, to my attention. Um, as, as close as he is to the government, I think he should be doing everything possible to make sure that, um, he, uh, he becomes that that liaison, right, between his people who are suffering, trying to make the government understand what, and being very honest about it, and not trying to um, uh, benefit from or pick up something, you know, beneficial from it. I think we all are hurting. I think this has affected ev almost every single uh, family um, um, in 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 the English speaking Cameroons, and I believe I I definitely believe that we all want a solution to this problem, right? But why hasn't this been discussed in in the halls of the Parliament in Cameroon? Is it that our francophone brothers? do not want to talk about this? Is it that truly we are just two cubes of sugar that our Francophone brothers thought they could just easily dissolve? Is it that, what is it that is so difficult? Because when, 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 when English speaking Cameroon rose up and said, we've had enough, right? This marginalization, this, these, these, we we cannot continue like this. Why? Because I know deep in my heart that, um, um, as as an English speaking Cameroonian, it doesn't matter whether you're federalist or a unionist or a separatist or uh, in my vocabulary, there's nothing like separatist. Um, I'm still looking for the vocabulary for it. Um. But every single aspect of these, these uh, uh, groups of people have been targeted, either by the military or by the known, you know, state actors. I'll call it that. 
how do we find a middle ground? How do we navigate this? And this question is to the, the previous panelists. Please, I want you to tell me why this problem has not been discussed. How do you resolve a problem that you don't even accept? I believe the government of Cameroon doesn't even accept, has not been able to accept that there is a problem, let alone begin to solve it. Where do we start? Please answer me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, madam. The problem is we should not be carried away with what some administrative official they say. The president of the Republic, the president of Cameroon have never said there is no Anglophone problem so that we can say the president have not recognized it. He has never said there is no Anglophone problem. And when you look at the solution he has put in place, you definitely know that uh, there is a problem. You remember the time, everybody knows the role he played when he was PM with regard to the dissatisfaction of uh, the Anglophone that he was sent by the former president, Amadou Aijo. So he is aware. Secondly, about the problem not being discussed in the National Assembly, it, it, it is the cumbersome nature of the Assembly that there are various uh, 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 um, commissions. And so this is being discussed at the level of commissions, okay? And they have discussed about it many times. But I'm d'accord with those that believe that it should be at the plenary session. But to assure you, it has been discussed at the parliament, but not at the plenary session, but at the commission in charge of that. And uh, secondly, you see, there is no hypocrisy in this. There is no ca uh, Cameroonian from the northwest and southwest <laughs> region, West Cameroonian or uh, 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 Southern Cameroon, no matter the appellation we want to give. There is yeah. nobody that is uh, comfortable. No. All our ministers, they oh, might yeah. be in Yaoundé, but they are not comfortable. There is nowhere like home. Parliamentarian, senator, and the rest. Everybody wants peace. And I don't remember any parliamentarian or senator or mayor or councillor who is an elected official that have come out to say there is no uh, 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 problem in the Northwest and Southwest or Anglophone problem or no matter the appellation we want to give. All these elected officials are aware. Where we are stuck now is the fact that we are supposed to bring our plight to our government in a diplomatic way, in dialogue and not arms. That's why we are pleading on our brothers that they should drop their arms while we continue the dialogue, while we continue the negotiation as a people. Now, look at, for instance, I am one of those that will tell you that it is a necessity for all English-speaking Cameroonians in the Northwest and in the Southwest to sit and discuss as a people. All right, all right. But can we really do that when our brothers that are killers, that are assassins, that are terrorists, are there with guns? If we go today and say, okay, let us sit today in Banso, all Anglophones from the two regions, are we safe? That is the problem. So we are telling our brothers to drop their arms so that we take the part of dialogue to ensure that we have a lasting solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll to, uh, let's hear from you, Mr. Robert Kedia. Uh, we look at some of the difficulties that uh, the, those in these two regions are going through. They say, he who wears the shoes knows where it pinches. Well, uh, Mr. Kedia has highlighted some of the uh, challenges, corpses of uh, the population being seized and taken into the bushes and uh, populations are uh, people are kidnapped for ransom we look at all these don't you think the people are fed up and somehow that's the reason why maybe they are giving information to the military to you know uh, invade the hideouts of the separatists the rule of, spy. The rule of spy in any war did not yeah. start with the ambazonian war of independence maybe in the first world war it happened in almost all the wars in the world. There have always been spies for and against. But before I come to your problem of the people being fed up, because uh, no matter what, I can never agree to the method used by the Ambazonian fighters to intimidate, to kill, to terrorize our people. Because the method, the method is not the method that a real and a bona fide born Southern Cameroonian opted for. That one, I don't hide it any longer. The method is a bad method. Now, let's find out who taught them the bad method to use. The government taught them. The government taught them. They, they who shot... They, they are who? using this uh, against the same people they claim they are protecting.
protect him. I am Their coming. I am coming, Luis. Yeah. I am coming. The government taught them how to cut people's necks. Sam Soya, who was the first person to be butchered at the square, three corners, Bello, my hometown, where I come from, was cut with a knife by the military forces whom I believe they are well trained. They know what it means to be qualified war crimes. They know what it means to take a suspect during a war period. And they know how to exploit such a suspect to get information. Not beheading. Now we're talking about the first bullet. Of, of no, I, I know, uh, I know. Yeah. We, are, we are talking about Ngusang. Yeah. The first bullet came out from the government. So the government should be held accountable. Now, talking about, I, I want to quickly respond to what my brother Kedia said. Picking up arms. Mm -hmm. Let not be carried away by this kind of CBDM. Uh, CBDM, uh, uh, CBDM uh, on the other hand, everywhere. I mean, you, you have to understand that before these people pick up arms, the government shot the first bullet. If the government had not shot the first bullet, I am not very sure that would have been where we are today. That said, two evils are killing Cameroon at a time. Bad governance that has opted for the option of the gun and the amber boys who have diverted from what the people of Southern Cameroonians wanted. And your question, your question was, are the people not fed up? Why do you think that the people should not be fed up? My mother escaped dead from the hands of these very boys. Why do you think that people should not be, 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 be fed up? When the same boys comes after you and they ask for long sums of money, from the beginning, everybody, look, these boys, have derailed the whole story. But I can assure you, the, 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 the spirit, the feeling, the marginalization of the Anglophones, who call the Southern Cameroonian, is spiritual. What these boys are doing is physical. Their own case will end one day. But the spirit and the feeling of that marginalization in us Anglophones remain. We are fed up with the method that these boys are using, but we are not fed up with the feeling of the marginalization. It remains in us. That is why you will discover that not everybody will collaborate against them. Those who are even against them, in their spirit, they know that they are still fighting a war that was declared against them by people who have marginalized them for, for more than 60 years. But it all boils down to bad leadership, Luis. If the leadership in place was a leadership that listens to the people, was a leadership that sought to solve or to provide solutions to the problem of the people, we will not have been where we are today. So we are where we are today because of problems that are man-made in Cameroon. That man-made problem in Cameroon have been was started by Ahijo and been aggravated by Mr. Bia and his CPDM, who have often said there is no Anglophone problem. And there are people who have been promoted Simply because they said there was no Anglophone problem in Cameroon. Today there are ministers. Some of them have, have, have even become ministers of mattress sharing in Cameroon. Everywhere you see them running, they are at the forefront of everything. Whereas at the beginning they said there was no Anglophone problem. So I think to better the Francophone say, pour mieux sauter, il faut reculer. At this time, I want to think that we have to make some steps back before we jump a step ahead. And that step back is to ask our question, beginning from the head of state, was the option of war necessary? Has the option of war given a solution? Will the option of war fix or leave the Cameroon that I wished to leave? Uh, Metro Alex, for since 2017, we saw the population they've been collaborating with uh, the separatists. When uh, the crisis turned into an armed conflict in 2017, the population, you know, have been siding with the separatists. But where we are today in 2023, the same population that the separatists claim they were supporting uh, are the people we see now they are executing on live uh, camera. With regards to equally the challenges that the population have been going through, recently we, we saw uh, two weeks in post goes down and 
all this boils down to um, you know the, the 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 weight force on the population don't you think the population are fed up with all these and they now being in the middle caught up in the middle between the amazonian and the military don't you think that they are choosing the side and now uh, it's falling back on them the population of course don't you think they are fed up with uh, the challenges they are going through with regards to what is happening Mr. Luis, the way I will answer your question, the reason people have a government, mm -hmm. it's a social contract. When, like Mr. Kaji said, that, oh, the government was elected. We had a prime minister in the UK who spent 45 days as prime minister. Being elected doesn't mean it's democracy. The point is, the population, I have a copy of the Constitution of Cameroon. It, there's nothing about the population there. If our country, you don't go into government to sleep in a bed of rooms. You go there to work for the people. You collect tax to work for the people. Let's assume, yes, there's a problem in Cameroon. They're killing people. The reason you were elected in power is to solve that problem. And my problem, I have a lot of concern when it comes to Mr. Kadir, I was in the national dialogue. I was the only person who brought to the attention of the decentralization committee that the invitation letter said, invitation for major national dialogue to discuss the problem in Northwest and Southwest region, as you call it, full stop. It was never discussed. So you keep on talking about dialogue. And I would like to draw the attention to Mr. Kadir. This is very important. How do you feel? Let's call it as an Anglophone or Southern Cameroonians. How do you feel that the money that you're using in Cameroon, there's no English written on that money? How do you feel? How do you feel that a NAM, that is a French culture that was brought in France, they are imposing it on Anglophone? Are you comfortable? A Economy Superior from France, are you comfortable? Military tribunal, trying civilians in a military court, how comfortable are you? Gendarmerie from France, that's the Anglophone problem. Do you need to be discussing? I went to Nguakere. Then Yaounde University, the only university in Cameroon. I studied public law. 99% of public law was in French. We struggled. I passed. We fought for Boya University because we said, no, this is not enough. I was in Guacala when the then government delegate of Yaounde, Emma Bazi, said that enemy dans la maison, le biafra, allez chez vous. These are things. It's not today. I'm against arms. I'm against people using arms. I'm just telling you, you don't know what some of us have gone through in that country. The problem is not between Anglophone civilians and Francophone civilians. The problem is a government. And we have some Anglophones. Mr. Kadja, I should say you're one of them now. And I will say this, you're looking your way in life and you think you must sing that praises that we say we thank the head of state. I'm telling you, I have a different political opinion with Mr. Bia, but I'm very close to Mr. Bia, but I don't agree with his policies. But sometimes we forget the bigger picture and we start saying, when the Anglophones, they join the Republic of Cameroon, what was it then? Do you want to join Nigeria or do you want to join the Republic of Cameroon? We were not conquered. We agreed to join. 300 years ago, Scotland decided to join the English people. They said, we don't want it again. They said, have a referendum in 2014. They voted that they want to stay with the United Kingdom. So what dialogue are you talking about? The point is, yes, no, our civilians are suffering. They are suffering. Why? You have to solve the problem. Sometimes you say we keep on dialoguing. 
There's an unemployment. Sometimes the people will call, Amber, how do you know that somebody is a separatist or not a separatist? Since this crisis that day, I've never heard about criminals, thieves anymore. Anybody can take arms because of unemployment, the failure of the government. The government has failed to create jobs. Most people from the English region, they go to Douala, Yaoundé to look for jobs. Why can they not have industries in their own area? Why can they not have airport? If you look at our situation in Cameroon, the first time I went to Northwest region in Cameroon, I took a flight. I was a baby from Tiko International Airport to Bali Nyonga Airport. I was a baby. We had power camp. Tiko International Airport, a lot of other things. Why are we so destructive? The problem is that the law of diminishing marginal return is facing us. Yes, all of us on this panel, we don't like killing. When I went to Bamenda, when I was a teenager, I used to walk the street at night from Sonat Street to Commission Avenue. Nobody used to disturb me. We can just stand and say, okay, they are criminals. These people are bad. They kill people. Okay, since this crisis started, I have never seen your government bringing the killer of Florence Ayafu, not to talk of Alaji Tita Fomukon, that was killed about in 2000 and early 1990, early 1990 in Bamenda. We have never seen anybody. We have a court that does not exist. They don't do anything. I would be happy to see people who commit offense to face the criminal justice system. Don't kill people and put gun behind them Beside them, they put Amber flag. I have a cousin from Bali Nyonga. He was killed. And they said he was Amber. He was not Amber. He was not armed. And when they killed him, they put things beside him. And luckily, I had an uncle who saw it and begged the gendarme. They gave the cops to that place. So sometimes, when they, they trademark this extrajudicial killing, we have seen it. I'm not saying all the military. The Cameroon government, the military, they do the same thing. They refuse. The former minister of communication, um, Chiruma, he refused when they kill some people in the north of Cameroon. BBC, other people, they check and they say they kill women and children. That's extrajudicial killing. It happens. The problem is we don't have an effective judicial system in Cameroon. And Mr. Kedja, listen, there's something I should tell you. Belonging to any political party doesn't make any difference to me. Some of my great friends in my life, they come from the CPDM and other political party. We have differences, it doesn't matter. When there is no light in Yaoundé, it affects all of us. When there is no water in Boya, it affects all of us. Sometimes, just come out from you, come out from your high horse and sit down and accept the general problem that we have. You are there today. Yesterday, so a couple of people, they died in Yaoundé, Obara, or whatsoever. They were killed. Those are Cameroonians. Why? You say, oh, drivers are driving bad or whatever. We should look at what we have in common. When the people, Dr. Enderly, removed the people from Eastern House, Inugu, and gave them autonomy in, in Boya in 1954, he said what? We are sick of these people. And he came to Boya. Okay, we, the English-speaking Cameroonians, accepted to join our French brothers. Good, we are African. So, Mr. Kedja, can you answer this question? If I decide to get into a marriage, do yeah, I have Matt, the right uh, to say, okay, it's not working, I want to leave? Matt, let me get the opinion of the other uh, uh, panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. John Bakuro, the, the question I want to ask you is, you, you indicated your regrets following the killing of uh, those uh, unarmed civilians in the uh, northwest region. But the question is, who are those giving those instructions to uh, those guys carrying guns who commit such atrocities? Do they have leaderships? Uh, Mr. Bitbank, before I really get to answering that specific question. I want to react very quickly to a few things that uh, Mr. Kedia said in just 30 seconds. You see, I like to be very specific about this here. When you talk about when they burn people's houses, how the people react, who is responsible for burning houses all over Southern Cameroon? The videos are there, everything is there. The military have burned down whole villages. About 400
hundred villages have been reduced to ashes by that military. When he talks about rape, we saw the military of La Republic de Cameroon pull students out of their hostels in the University of Boya, rob them in mud, rape some, desecrate them. We saw them in Balinyunga. Do you recall that at some point the colonial governor in Bamenda had to call a policeman that was caught live raping a young a young mother, a young girl of, of, of about 23, with child. So when Mr. KJ is talking, I want to ask, who is he routing for? For a British murderous administration or for the people he claims to be his people? And when you make reference to uh, uh, elected officials, even elected by who? Because I've had to turn Bella Moki and the others to their faces when I can, that nobody elected them. They are all imposters. You know, Elekam has the figures. No elections have been taking place in Southern Cameroon since 2016. Because when they tell you a figure of 3%, 5%, you know it's the military and other civil servants who are out there and who are counted in to, to go and vote. The people are clear about one thing. We are not separatists. We are pro-independentists. We are not separating because we never belong to La Republic of Cameroon. La Mette said, we agreed to get into a union which never even materialized. And La Republic of Cameroon turned around to think that they could simply colonize us. This is where we are. Going back to your question now, as you're asking, who is it that you is It's the same question that I will ask you regarding those talks on Yaoundé. Who are Slotting people up. If you talk about extrajudicial killings, 90% of those extrajudicial killings are committed by the by the forces of Mr. Paul Bia in the southern Cameroons. Now, for the various groups, they all know their leaders, their leaders are not hiding. No, their leaders are not hiding. Questions if uh, John Bakuro. Uh... Madam uh, Vivian uh, Ayafo, that, let me get to you with that question and uh, the action, the, the question. Uh, we'll come back to you, Madam Ayafo. All right, we'll come back to you. Just uh, time for us to hear from Mr. Robert Kedia uh, regarding what uh, John Bakuru and uh, the lady said. You see, John Bakuru has to stand. You understand? And the other co cool panelists. Are those that believe in that? Uh, you know, no. Now, what I would Let like to say is that um, when we are logging for peace, when we are looking for peace, we need to follow the way of dialogue. And I see, say, the President of the Republic, President Povia, his main agenda is dialogue. The military have sworn an oath to protect the sovereignty of the nation. That's why they are in the field to do what they have sworn an oath for. And so we are relying on dialogue, how we can discuss together as Cameroonian. But now, what I say is the fact that our brothers with arms need to drop the arms. I see say it. Many people believe that it's time for us as people of Northwest and Southwest to sit and discuss. But today, what guarantee that if we sit today, those that have picked up arms will not come and attack and kill many of us, that they are our own brother. I can I have that ability that if our brother drop arms, I will go and stand in front of the presidency and say, our people want to sit and talk. But what guarantee if I go do that and they say, okay, you people should go and talk, and we have people that are pick up arms that are ready to kill some of us, their own blood brothers. That's the problem we are having. We have elected officials. Uh, I don't know when you hear Mr. Mbakuru talking, you realize that he has a personal problem with a senator from the Southwest region. That is his personal problem, their personal emotion, that's why he keep on calling him. But they are the legitimate people we have. They are the legal people we have to talk for us, and we must support them. The time has passed for those of you that say you want peace. The time has passed that we will insult all our senators, parliamentarians, mayor, and councillors. The time has passed. Well, we will insult all our chiefs and call them blacklegs and degrade them. The time has passed 
where all our men of God should be insulted, pastor, priest, insulted, cardinal, kidnapped, priest, killed. They are those that are there. They are our elites. Social elite has to do with our chiefs, men of God. Economic elite has to do with our successful businessmen, uh, our educated elite that are in the diaspora. We need everyone to discuss and bring a final peace. We should stop degrading anyone that wants to come and bring peace. If today, somebody like uh, Agwabala will stand up to say, okay, fine, we are going to a third republic. It's time we see an Anglophone to be the next head of state. Oh my God. He was insulted by instant Anglophones. Francophone, they supported him. Many of them supported the ideal, but who insulted Anglophones? If any chief wants to come and start, he will be insulted. Any elite, uh, look at one of the most powerful political elites we have of recent time that just died, Mr. Nijon Fundi. What happened? He was kidnapped by Amber. Anyone that comes to talk on our behalf, we degrade them. And we say we want to talk, we say we are a people, we don't see the problem. Even among those in the diaspora, they fight among themselves. They insult among themselves. They call themselves sellout. They do terrible things, insult in video. Is that the Anglophone culture? Okay. We need to come back as a people with moral value that we can sit together. We should stop insulting anyone that can instant stand and speak for us. Now I say today where we are today, who is the Anglophone that can stand really and speak? And we say, no, he has spoken for Anglophones. We've insulted everybody, degraded everybody, made everybody to lose their value in the international community and even within the national uh, territory. That is the problem we have. And if we say we have an Anglophone culture, that is the first Anglophone culture that we have destroyed, that we are supposed to polish, so that we will have our people represent us and talk for us. Okay. If we can't do that, then we are a failure oh. as a people. So when we are accusing the government, we should look at where we have failed oh. as a people. All right. Uh, thanks very much. We, we got you, Mr. Robert Kidia. Uh, Mr. Njum, you are a member of a civil society. At this juncture, how do we prevent such extrajudicial killings from happening? Because the population, we understand, are caught up in the middle. Those who cannot run out of the regions are stuck there. If they are not targeted today, probably by a street bullet, they will be targeted by the separatists, or they might commit a crime that will end them in the dragnet to the military. How do we end such uh, atrocities, killings of the population? Uh, if wishes were horses, I would have opted no. that the president of the republic goes down to Northwest and apologize to the people, goes to Southwest and apologize to the people. Unfortunately, I am not and a member. Do you think that will in any way stop yes. the problem? I, for one, uh, I have a feeling if the president goes down to Norway today, I will give him my support 100%. And I will carry uh, the crusade. And the question is, would that immediately solve the problem? And what no, would that there, solve? there is no way. Look, with the, I, don't play, I don't play hypocrisy, Luis. There is no immediate stop to the crisis. It must take a process. The problem is that from the start, they never knew. They thought they were just going to take a sharp bend and everything was going to be the way they wanted. But they met with a stiff eye. And what I was saying is that since it cannot be stopped like magic, the first step, the president of the republic has to go down to the field, apologize to the people of southern Cameroon. That's one. Since I'm not a member of the government, I can only propose. If they like, they can take it. If they like, they should not take it. Okay. As we are asking the boys to down their guns, I don't know how I can be asking people to down guns that I did not ask them to pick up guns. I will be saying it simultaneously that uh, let the military go back to the barracks and let and the boys now drop, let the boys drop their guns. Okay. As the boys so which should happen first? The guys should drop their guns or the military should go back to the No, it should be simultaneous. It should be simultaneous. If the, so head, of look at, look at the, the head of state yeah. has to call for a ceasefire, that ceasefire at that time 
will clearly send a message to every Cameroonian. So that if you hear that there is somebody in Batibo, there is somebody in Mbweni, there is somebody in Belo, still holding up a gun, let the population take its responsibility, rally behind the head of state to know that these people are the ones who do not want peace. The confusion has often been that if the government forces go back to the barracks, mm -hmm. these boys will kill everybody who has maybe uh, collaborating with the military. Mm -hmm. But then, have we tried it? The head of state has not first of all pronounced ceasefire. That is where we have to start. That said, I equally want to think that our elites have a role to play. Okay. They have been sleeping for long. Singing and dancing in Yaoundé in the name of pressing the president has not been helping issues. All right. That is where I have often said, I am not against anybody doing politics, Louis. I'm against the manner in which people do their politics. If you are doing your politics of your one-man show at the detriment of the population, that is what I'm against. Mm. So I will only repeat, the head of state has what it takes to end this crisis tomorrow, right. but he has refused to do so. And again, the people he has chosen to collaborate with them have been the wrong collaborators because they have added more fuel to an already burning fire than what would have quelled down that fire. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Njeroum. Um, Maitre, uh, before we come to you, let's hear John Bakuro. Just briefly, as we were going out of the first topic, what do you think can be done to stop the killing of the population? Just briefly, we are wrapping up with the first topic and we shall be discussing the second topic just briefly. So uh, your reaction to what do you think can be done to stop the killings? You were uh, talking about the leadership and who gives instructions to these guys to commit the crimes they are committing. I first of all want to remark that uh, sometimes I feel I have the feeling that you just bring me to the program as the gathering. They don't give me room to talk. When I start talking, I mean, before I notice it, I get cut. Other panelists actually take time to elaborate their points. So I will request that if you bring me onto the program, let me also be able to express myself. That said, going now to your question, I first of all want to note that uh, nobody's going to drop any gun down. Not a single person will drop a single gun down until the government of La Republic du Cameroon comes to his senses to understand that we have to meet on the general table to discuss the root causes of this conflict. Where we are now, we have gone past that point where somebody will just sit in a bedroom somewhere and start shouting, let them drop down their guns. How do they pick guns? Because no, nobody in southern Cameroon has ever dreamt about having to pick guns to do anything. That's why you know the motto of the SCNC from, from inception has remained the force of argument and not the argument of force. No one forced that on us. But when they started killing our people, raping our women, I mean, raising down our, our structures, the people were forced to defend themselves. And self-defense is a right recognized internationally. So how will this end? There is just one thing that needs to happen. La Republic of Cameroon needs to know that they have to come to the table. If they don't come to the table, I'm assuring you, the boys are increasing in capacity every day. Every day. The Republic of Cameroon should not dream that they will win something militarily. It will not happen. It will not happen yesterday. It will not happen today. It will not happen even tomorrow. Because as the days are going by, the boys are getting more refined. And contrary to Kedia and the other misguided uh, elites are to deceive the Republic to think, Listen, they're increasing in number. They are not reducing. That is why recently, when they took Boya by storm, everybody was surprised because they were told by Kedia and the others that there were just about three of them left in the bush. So what I want to make you know is that when you refuse to talk peacefully with a people who have called your attention to their plight several times, and you prefer to use the higher hand, you prefer to use war, the people will offer you war. And for the Ambazonians, I'm, I'm telling you, Mr. Big Bang, right here on motion television, 
that the people of southern Cameroon will never drop guns. We will never, ever drop them again. We were stupid in 1961. We will never be stupid again. So now the people of Cameroon better come to their senses and come to the negotiation table. It will never end. Thank you. Uh, well, we're here to seek uh, solutions to end the crisis, like I, like I said, only those who wear the shoes knows where it, uh, where it pins. And, uh, but I'm, uh, Vivian, what do you think? How do we end the killing of the population in these two English-speaking regions? Briefly. Louis, thanks again. I think this ends by, you all hear me, please thumbs up. I think this ends by, um, <laughs> by dialogue, right? By the table and talking. Um, we men, or you all men, I would say, you all men can, can scream and yell and talk and, 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 and hit your chest and, and, and all what you want, but uh, as a woman, as a mother, my heart, my heart pains, my heart bleeds for the things I've seen happening. The black on, the, the black, on black hate, the black on black um, slaughters, the black on black murders, um, it's got to end. And for my other brother there who talks about the government is willing to talk. I remember last year there was a Canadian uh, uh, initiative that was started. I want to ask him, since the government is so willing to talk, what happened to those talks? To the best of my knowledge, the prime minister, the premier of Cameroon is the one who worked so hard to make that happen. And guess what? It never happened. And so if he claims that the government wants to talk, um, I think it's a fallacy. And I want to remind him that he will soon become a target of that same government he's supporting because he just needs to turn and look at um, some of his brothers and sisters, his friends who have struggled to make that government reason and yet it's not happened. Soon they become targets. It's a government that sponsors terrorism. We all know it. Let's accept it. Let's look for solutions. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, <coughs> Madam Vivian Naya. For Metro Alex Nzip, briefly, how do we end uh, this killings and how do we uh, help the population to come out of the sufferings which they are going or they are into? as a result of the crisis? Without repeating what the other panelists said, this is my solution. The government of the Cameroons, they have to recognize that we need equal status, not spatial status. Why do I say so? It's simple. Mr. Bia made a statement in France sometimes that they try to integrate. And if you look at the English definition of integration is assimilation, is annexation. That's what Mr. Bia said, not me. I'm sure you have that video. Again, former vice president of Cameroon, John Gu Foncha, you use this word, I'm quoting, the video is there on YouTube. We have been annexed. So my point is simple accept equal status. What does equal status mean? Two countries came together. I'll give you, for the sake of our audience, what's the definition of a country? Political authority. I studied in Wakele. My lecturer, a constitutional lecturer, Bipum Jean Goumari, later is what? Political authority, a population, and a territory. The West Cameroon, whatever name you call it, had a political authority. Dr. Endele as a prime minister. He had um, um, the House of Chiefs. We have elected representatives. Then we have a territory and a population. That was a country. 
A country does not need to be independent. Scotland is a country is not independent. England is a country is not independent. And Wales and Northern Ireland, they are all countries inside United Kingdom. We were a country, French Cameroon, English Cameroon, in Federal Republic of Cameroon. That part, the English country have disappeared. So all we need to do is to say, if Mr. Bia just sit and say, we have equal status. We, two countries came together. Let's respect our inherited institution and our local indigenous institution. I bet you, I'm sure even John Baakur, who is listening to me, I'm sure he will be happy to say that they recognize the fact that two countries came together. That is the beginning of it. That's a solution to me. Rather than telling people that we cannot control to drop their arms, let the government just sit in a 2D. We have recognized that two countries came together, and we have to accept that they have a different institution from us. We can live together by respecting the fact that we are different. I will tell people, I'm sure most Cameroonians they will be very shocked. Scotland have got its own money. They are in the United Kingdom. They have different money. The legal system in Scotland is different from England, but they are in the same country. Scotland have got a football team different from England, but they are in the same country. Staying in the same country doesn't mean one size fits all. Accept that we are different. Our ethnicity and our culture or what, what we inherited from France and England is so different that we have to be doing, if we want to stay doing different things, why should you have a police officer in former West Cameroon, then you are bringing gendarmes. We don't need gendarmes. We don't need this. Let the police police. In the United Kingdom, police is relationship between the population and the police forces. A police in London have nothing to do with the police in Manchester, Liverpool, or other part of this country. What does a gendarme in Marua got to do in Boya? You have to leave people to police their community. We have that too. We say one Cameroon means that everybody must eat bongo chobi. That's not how you solve a problem. You have to accept our ethnicity. Ethnicity. Even in Cameroon, the Southern Cameroon High Court law, which say every native law that is repugnant to natural justice, equity, and good conscience, the common law should prevail. We have those things in paper. We are okay. different. We have different custom and tradition. So the solution is. Equal status. Let's all of us practice our inherited culture differently. Then we respect what I call ethnocultural democracy. All tribes are equal. This thing we call region. One point that is very important that I will make. What's a region? When you draft constitution, you don't draft it based on geographical location. Region is geographical location. What do you do? You look at the culture of the people. We have an English and French culture, one. Then we have our indigenous culture. But you see people who come, 10 state civilization. All right, Meg. I'm Southwest, I'm Northwest. We have Northwest and Southwest. One second, Mr. Luis, this point is important. We have Northwest and Southwest in the United Kingdom. We have Northwest and Southwest in America, all over the world. We are not Northwest and Southwest. We are a people, and that is how you solve a problem by making sure that you direct the problem to the culture of the people rather than geographical location. All right. Uh, thank you, Med. Thanks for that. And just uh, some comments on uh, the topic we have, which has to do with Africa at the G20, which now becomes G21. The African Union is now a member of uh, the uh, forum uh, for international economic cooperation among industrialized countries uh, G20. This is coming at the time the there was a shift in global geopolitics and the African Union is being represented as a member of the G20 which becomes G21 now. Mr. Ndium, we just want to find out from you quickly. African Union as a member of the G20, what impact do you think this is going to have with regards to who is going to decide on behalf of the whole of Africa? We're talking about 50 uh, four countries going in to be a member at the G20. 
what impact do you think this will have with starting with leadership or who decides? Well, when you look at uh, when you look at it, when you look at a general overview of <coughs> the the objectives of the G20 in the first place, they talked about climate change. Most of the things that they want to change, uh, resilient economies. Uh, most of the things that that that, that they discussed or they put forward as they put their agenda, you discover that Africans per se are suffering most of these things, not caused by Africans themselves, caused by the Western world. And they are the same people who come up with the agenda of 2020, uh, 2030, I think, 2030, uh, G, whether they say uh, G, D, uh, G, S, G, D, Sustainable uh, Development Goals, <laughs> SDGs, yes, Sustainable Development Goals. When you look at them critically, you discover that Africans need to go there. The question I asked when I glanced through that document was, are we going there as equals, or are we going there on the servant master beast approach? If we were to go there as equals, it would have been good that our leaders don't go there with their heads buried in the sand like ostrich or like ostriches so that in the long run, we start crying as we have always cried. We need to, the terms of African county, uh, co uh, continent, let me put it this way, joining the G20, the terms need to be very clear. If we are not going on equal terms, I think the African leaders should not venture. But if we are to go there on equal terms, it will be a good initiative because when you look at empowering the women, goals towards education drive in Africa, climate change, which of course we need to always underline that this climate change thing was not a thing of Africa. It has come with the causes from the white man's land. Africa, from the, is, Africa is just a victim. So you don't victimize me, then you call me again to come so that we look for uh, solutions together not on equal basis, but on the basis of seven master approach. If it is on uh, to be on the basis of equal approach. Unfortunately, the time has cut off, so we cannot go deep into it. Okay. But if it has to be on equal approach, then I think it could be of some benefit. Okay. But I am still very much skeptical, very skeptical. I think we shall have time to actually diagnose, to look at the origins of the G20, the benefits on the part of those who came up with the initiative and those who are to be joining the initiative. All right, Mr. Kedja, briefly, do you think the G20, African being a member of the G20, will benefit the continent? For me, as a Pan-Africanist, with my little knowledge in uh, political science and history, I believe that we need to empower, first of all, our African Union to make it have an importance that it can solve its internal problem. I don't believe in us running to the West to demand them for a solution. Oh, talk about the G20 is made up of 19 sovereign states before the European Union coming in with their own member states that are already there. And you see a whole bundle of uh, continent of Africa of 54 countries will just go there as a single entity. We don't even know who will be there, who will decide for us. The terms are not known. So instead, I will not like uh, to go into such aspect. Really, uh, our, um, our, our African Union should be able to solve our domestic problem back home. We have series of crises which have to do with poverty and hunger crisis uh armed conflicts all over the national uh, uh, uh the african continent that i think uh which uh, the african union should be able to solve rather than going uh, behind the european union which i think normally is to always go there the person that will be sent to represent the g20 will be in a hotel and enjoy a lot so really i will not have chance to talk about that but to conclude i would just like to tell all the people of uh, northwest and southwest or west cameroon that at the moment, we are struggling to ensure that uh, we'll have a representative of the region. It could be a minister in charge of uh, the Anglophone uh, 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 community or the Camer uh, Camer uh, Anglophone entity that will be able to follow up the interests of our people. If they say, for instance, there is a concours, we'll have someone that will ensure that it is respected. If they are talking about jobs in state entities, 
we ensure that anglophones are duly represented. I believe that that's what at the level of the CPGM uh, anglophones or those of this region we are struggling to have so that our quota will be respected. Regional balance will be respected. And when they talk about regional balance, us of the Northwest region, we simply say that we are an entity that joined the country. So we are supposed to have more. Uh, my co-panelists talk about uh, 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 not special status, but equal status. So that is what we are struggling to have. Mm -hmm. But us of the CPDM, we have the, these difficulties on fighting for this when our own brothers have arms, we are killing ourselves. We are quarreling among ourselves. We are insulting ourselves. This, weak, this weakens our power as an entity to be able to fight for our own share of the national cake. That's why I am pleading that let us drop the arms and we'll look for dialogue and we have the okay. capacity we have yeah. to fight for our own share. If they say today the concourse of police is out, 400 people have passed. Yes, Anglophones should be there at least 100. Mm. It is not regional balance, like we are not a region that you classify us equal like the other region. We are a people that join. So we have to have the specificity that we can see. And so we need a minister, or uh, we can put it in any way, that will be in charge of the dis, um, complaints or ensuring that uh, there is no marginalization of the Anglophone at the level of the center, central government that will have power to speak on behalf of the people. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Merchants, if briefly, uh, just briefly, uh, because we are against time, just briefly, what do you think Africa stands to benefit at the G20? Let's first of all talk about the uh, leadership. I was looking at uh, the coming into G20 at a time when there was this change uh, in geo global geopolitics and there was this fight between the West and Russia. Do you think this is the kind of way uh, the West is trying to draw Africa into its uh, into its ampit? And do you think this is actually worth uh, you know embracing or celebrating Africa being a member of the G20? The G20 was about macroeconomic factors such as interest rate and national productivity. So when we look at originally, that's what the G20 was. When you look at them, when it comes to interest rate, do Cameroon and other smart countries, can they independently determine their interest rate? No, it's joint. And this started since 1959 under UDAC, and today it's SEMAC. So we cannot do that, so you should look at in that point. However, the G20 expanded in what we call what sustainable development, health, agriculture, and energy, environment, um, um, climate change, um, anti-corruption. And they say 85% um, of the global economic um, output comes from what? The G20. 75% um, of um, global export come from the G20. 80% of world population comes from the G20. But however, Let's look, a common man in the street in Cameroon or other African countries, do we benefit from that? No. My point is very simple. I look at what an ordinary person in Cameroon in the street can benefit from. When they talk about anti-corruption, if you look at uh, Transparency International, the first 20 countries, they are Africans. When it comes to environment, the people polluting the world are this industrial country, it doesn't concern Africa. When we look at agriculture or export or whatsoever, they don't want we are not industrialized. What made the Western country to become what they are today is the industrial revolution. When we have 54 African countries, why can we not cooperate our, among ourselves? Why do we need to go out of Africa? I believe in charity begins at home. I know what they call in economics, Comparative cost advantage. What do we need? South Africa have got the technology to do ABC. Okay, let's allow South Africa to do this. Um, Ivory Coast are better off in cocoa. Did it, did it. Let's allow them. Nigeria is good about this. Let's start our trade among us before looking outside. What we need is technology. And if we have that technology, I bet you Africa will be the best of the best. So let's just forget to me. I live in the Western world. They too are looking, how can they help their citizens? Do you think 
They will look at Africa. That Africa, we should go to Africa before Europe. No. Or other America or whatever. So my point is simple. Africans, you've got a lot on your plate, good things. Focus on what you have. You have everything in Africa. The timber, if you want to deal with the European Union, what do you need to do? G20. This is my point of view. If you want to produce mobile phone, come and produce it in Cameroon, in Congo, in Kinshasa. If you want leather chairs, bring your engineers to produce it in Cameroon, in South Africa, and this, so we can have the jobs inside our country. Rather than for us, because until today, as I speak, the constitution of CDC says we have to export the product. Why should we keep on exporting the product when the banana, the timber, all those things, we can use it in Cameroon and manufacture things and create jobs for our people. So we should be looking at those things to me. I'm not a fan when I look at the list of the members who are in the G20. They are the people who enslave us, colonize us, promoted apartheid. Am I a fan of the G20? No. A chameleon or a leopard cannot just change his spots in a second. So Africans for Africans. Uh, met Africans for Africans. Uh, Madam uh, Vivian uh, Ayafo, we have the Brits. We have uh, the Brits open exams to welcome Africa into its uh, union. And uh, now uh, the G20 is quickly opening its arms equally to welcome uh, African Union. What do you think and how do you think this is playing out? And do you think the G20 is a place for Africa to be, considering that we are still hoping to have a seat at the Security Council. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Louis, for for that question. Um, I will start by saying, the African Union uh, needs to clean house first, right? And when I say clean house, the there is a saying that he who uh, calls the shots or he who feeds calls the shots he who sponsors calls the shots right and at the moment the african union cannot even sponsor itself the african union is bleeding the af on top of the african union sits some of the most um some of the most um um dictatorial regimes right who do not want to change things as far as moving forward is concerned. And then secondly, when you look at the, the, the G20, uh, in the G20 um, is most of those Western countries, like uh, my brother Metro Alex said, um, sits all our colonizers. I'm not saying we should stick to the the, the colonial aspect of, of us and, and forget that we still need to move on. And at this point, we Africans need to embrace the fact that colonization happened. It has passed. Move forward and do the things that need to be done. Now, um, colonization happened and passed. What is happening to us present day? What What's wrong with our leadership? Can we actually boast of any positives um, as far as the AU joining G20 is concerned? No, I, I can't. Personally, there's no use for it because when you look at the meetings that happen predominantly, uh, when you see Russia calling African leaders, and, and it's disgraceful. When I sit here as, an, as a Pan-Africanist and see you know, Russia, China, all these countries calling a whole continent, leaders of a whole continent to come and sit and get lectured upon. It's, it's a shame. Why can't our continent for once host some of those summits? Are we not capable? But then when you ask this question, you turn around and say, can they even sponsor <laughs> Can the AU sponsor any of those summits? We go around acting like beggars all over the world. You know, uh, pretty soon I'm going to see a country like Bangladesh, uh, uh, South, um, 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 those small countries, right? 
equally invite, you know, uh, AU to come and sit down and get lectured. It's it's a shame, and and we need to sit up. Those these these joinings and disjoinings and all this whatnot, it isn't helping. It's not going to take us anywhere. Let's start from uh, transforming our products, like one of our brothers said. Can we boast of transforming our cocoa? Can we boast of transforming our coffee? Can we boast of transforming uh, all these rubber, rubber? Can we boast of transforming any of this? Until we get there, until we start doing business one another, uh, opening our borders, right? Um, whether we join or disjoin <laughs> or separate or unseparate, Louis. We need to grow up as Africans. Yeah. And it starts from a change of leadership, a change of regime. We need forward thinking leaders. You don't expect me to sit here and see the president of, of my country, Cameroon, sitting in a meeting, sleeping, not even being able to stay awake, going in public force, getting disoriented. It is a shame. It is a shame. We need to change. We need to move forward. And it starts from leaders accepting that they cannot lead. Please. Thanks, Lewis. Madam Vivian Ayako, thanks very much for that. Uh, John Ba Akuru, when you look at Africa getting into uh, the G20, and you look at uh, John Ba Akuru, well, it's unfortunate it seems to have lost John, lost John Ba Akuru. And uh, uh, certainly that's uh, where we put a cap on today's program. We want to greatly appreciate all those of you who uh, took out time to uh, follow the program back at home, or those of you who are watching us online. We want to appreciate you for always tuning into your Pan African Television Africa Media. Mr. Ndium Emmanuel, civil society actor, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming. We appreciate uh, Mr. Robert Kedia, we equally appreciate your time. Thank you very much for being a part of today's uh, Pan-African debate. We had on Zoom, we had uh, Madam uh, Ayafo, Vivian Ayafo, who is equally um, a political uh, analyst. Madam Ayafo is a political and human rights advocate. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Vivian Ayafo, for your time. Metro Alex Ndif Lesingye, political consultant and human rights advocate. You are equally part of the program. Thank you very much. Join us by Zoom. John Bakuro was there, president of uh, Consortium, and uh, of course, uh, Mr. Robert Kedia, member of the CPGM. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, until we meet again, we just want to remind you that the rebroadcast of the program will be yours on Monday at exactly uh, 3 p.m. West uh, African time, 14 hours GMT. Until then, thank you equally to our technicians who made it possible. And equally, uh, stay tuned for more programs will be yours on Africa Media, of course. Stay with us. Bye-bye.